Good morning, Walnut Village. We're in week 20 of our study in the Gospel of Mark, and today we're in the, in the chapter 15, where we'll uh, see Jesus uh, as he approaches his crucifixion and then experiences trials and uh, all the emotions that go around this time leading up to his death. But uh, let's start today with just a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, so many in our world are suffering from virus, from worry, from fear, from loss of work, loss of job, so many things to worry about. But you are in control of this world, Lord, and you will bring us through. Help us to encourage each other, we pray. And through your word today, we ask that each heart would be encouraged with a message directly from you. In your son's name, amen. Well. Uh, remembering last week we were in the second half of chapter 14 and we looked at four very familiar vignettes or stories about Jesus. One, Jesus praying in the garden and committing to God, thy will be done. And then two, the arrest of Jesus and the reactions of his disciples. Three, the mock trial before the religious leaders. Uh, it was such a bogus trial. And then four, Peter's three-time denial of Jesus, and that's where we left it. Uh, then we also saw last week Jesus praying in Gethsemane, and in his humanness, uh, he experiences dread of what lies ahead for him. He feels deeply the injustice, the abandonment, the pain, the humiliation, and the grief, such that we can always be assured he understands our needs at all times in every circumstance. And then Jesus gives us a model for prayer in the second half of chapter 14. One, start with praise. And his phrase to his father was, everything is possible with you, Father. And then number two, state specifically your need. And we see Jesus does this by saying, please, Father, take this cup of suffering away from me. And then three, submit to God's will. And Jesus does this with those wonderful words, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And that sentence, those words, that's something that should always be before us, in the front of our minds as we pray. Yet, God, I want your will to be done, not mine. Now in response to Jesus' deeply moving prayer, the father did not take the cup from Jesus. He didn't say, okay, Jesus, do over. You don't have to go to the cross. Let's, let's go to plan B. No, instead, what did God in his wisdom do? He strengthened Jesus to be able to take and drink the cup. God was not going to be diverted from his perfect plan of salvation for all of us, his children. And Jesus was key to this, and that included that terrible march to his crucifixion death and then the joy of his resurrection afterward. At the cross we saw that Jesus became as it were an enemy of God who judged and forced uh, who was judged and forced to drink the cup of the father's fury so that he would not have to drink from so that we would not have to drink from this cup excuse me. We're talking about cup I should have another cup of coffee this morning. But this was the source of Jesus' agony. And that was that uh, he had to make this decision in the garden. He had to take the full fury of God upon himself to spare us. Uh, but he made that decision in the garden. He didn't make it at the cross. He didn't make it on the way to the cross. He made it in the garden. That's when he really said, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. So Jesus is agonizing. He comes back from prayer alone with the Father and he finds the disciples asleep. How disheartening. Jesus wants the support of his trusted disciples, and in his greatest hour of need, they fail and they fall to human frailties in sleep. And again, there is no uh, devastation or disappointment that we can face that Jesus himself has not faced and overcome. And then Judas, one of the 12 disciples we read, arrives with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. And sometimes we fail to recognize the physical danger that is a, an unruly mob of men with weapons, threats, violence, and intimidation. That's what greeted Jesus and the disciples in that moment in the garden. But we tend to focus on a betrayal, a, quite a calm kiss, 
uh, just a, a relative easy betrayal, and we don't fully grasp the fear the disciples must have experienced. Here's the other thing. All his disciples, we read in the second half of 14, deserted him and ran away. And Mark stresses abandonment here, the pain of it, again, so that we fully understand what Jesus went through and know that he understands what we go through at times. And then upon his arrest, we saw that Jesus was first taken to Annas, then to an illegal night court of the Sanhedrin, which Mark describes, then to an official daylight trial of the Sanhedrin, then to Pilate, who sent Jesus to Herod, who sent Jesus back to Pilate, where he then went to the cross. Rather a complex time overnight. And these proceedings were really the height of hypocrisy. In our uh, days uh, looking at our own government and both parties are crying, uh, hypocrisy at the other party. Here we really see it's it's nothing new in history because it, it happened here with Jesus. The hearings, the fake trial, the violent uh, that was carried out against Jesus, it all violated Jewish rules. For the Sanhedrin was not allowed to meet at night or on the Passover. So the religious leaders violate their own laws about acquiring evidence hearing witnesses, and observing a waiting period before the execution. The chapter ends with the strong, bold, courageous Peter, overcome with emotion at what must have seen to him the unforgivable sin against his Lord and Master. But we all know the story did not end there. It didn't end with Peter's broken heart. It didn't end with him being unforgiven, as we will see. Finally then, in 14, here also is recorded in these events a significant contrast between Judas and Peter, two of Jesus' disciples. Both of them denied Jesus in one way or another, but one was restored and the other was not. Now, lest our pride rise up within us, um, we need to identify with both Peter and Judas because every time we sin, we deny Jesus. We betray him every time we sin. But grace is great, and pardon is wonderful, and it comes freely from God as we repent and turn to him. So that was chapter 14. Now our passage today, Mark 15, starts with Jesus' trial before Pilate, one of the stages in that long overnight series of events to try Jesus and to try to get him to the point where the religious leaders could put him to death without getting Rome riled up. So verse 15 starts with this phrase, very early in the morning. Well, let me stop. It was necessary for the Sanhedrin to bring its business to Pilate as soon after dawn as possible because the working day of a Roman official began at the earliest hour of daylight. Legal trials in the Roman Forum were customarily held shortly after sunrise, so that's why they had to get to him very early in the morning. So we read very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of the religious law, the entire high council, met to discuss their next step. They bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Now the Jewish leaders uh, took Jesus to Pilate because they did not have the legal right to execute their own criminals. And obviously they took liberties with the law and corrupt Roman officials might ignore the occasional sidestep by the Jewish religious leaders just to keep peace and to placate them. And we know this because in the case of the stoning of Stephen, Jewish leaders put him to death. And we read that in the book of Acts. Jesus was such a high visible, high profile case that the Romans could not turn a blind eye. They dare not risk uh, uh, breaking the law. And, and so the, the Jews had to work hand in hand with the dreaded Roman government to affect the death uh, and removal of Jesus. All right, verse two, Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Now the Jewish rulers knew that if they brought Jesus before Pilate on the charge of claiming to be God, 
Pilate would probably just yawn and say, oh, we Romans have hundreds of gods. What's the big deal? What is the harm with just one more? Yet, if the Jewish leaders brought Jesus before Pilate as the king of the Jews, then that's a horse of a totally different color. Pilate would have to take Jesus seriously as a potential political threat because there could be no king except Caesar and Pilate was Caesar's representative. So here again we see how God uses the people, uh, uses the Jews, uses Rome, uses the laws of the time to carry out his plan for crucifixion of Jesus and resurrection. Moving on, Jesus replied to Pilate's question, are you king of the Jews? Jesus replied, you have said it. Now Jesus was indeed the king of the Jews, but not in a political or military sense. This is why he said yes to Pilate's question, but yes with a reservation. Notice the language, you have said it. And why he said nothing to the further accusations against him was again so that he didn't derail the plan to, that led to his crucifixion and death. Verse 3, then the leading priests kept accusing him of many crimes. Now the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. He just remained silent. If Jesus answered a plain yes to Pilate's question, Pilate would have immediately declared Jesus guilty of treason against Rome. Because Jesus gave a qualified yes, it merited further examination by Pilate and other officials. Now we do read in Luke uh, chapter 23, verse 2, this. It tells us what these accusations were. They said Jesus incited the people to riot, that he told them not to pay their taxes, and that he fancied himself a king in the political opposition to Rome. These were serious charges that would get Rome's attention. Pilate, however, was unconvinced, so the accusers repeated and strengthened the third charge. That's the one they focused on. He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning in Galilee, to this place. That would get Pilate's attention, because above all else, he needed peace, peace within the Jewish area that he ruled, or he might likely be removed by higher Roman authorities. So Jesus replied, you have said it. Then the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes, and Pilate asked him, are you going to answer them? What about all these charges they are bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pirate's, uh, pirate. <laughs> much to Pilate's surprise. Pilate marveled, marveled, he was surprised. No doubt Pilate had seen many men grovel before him for their lives. He also stood in judgment of many men as the governor of this Roman province. Yet there was something different about Jesus that Pilate marveled at. All the answers Jesus gave and the silence he held were calculated to bring about his continued path to the cross. It was all the outcome of his obedience to his Father's will. Verse 6, now it was the governor's custom each year during Passover celebration to release one prisoner, any one the people requested. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Pilate says, would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews? For he realized by now that the leading priests had arrested Jesus out of envy. Let me stop here. Pilate was no friend of the Jews. He could see through their manipulation, and he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. And this made Pilate want to find a way to free Jesus even more. It's human nature. Pilate knew what was the truth, but he was too weak, too desirous of retaining power to do the right thing. So we see this amalgam of human weakness here in the, in the Jewish leaders and their envy of Jesus in Pilate's disgust with the Jewish leaders, in Pilate's weakness himself and his desire just at all costs to retain power. Verse 11, but at this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Well, there was something working against the Jews. 
History tells us that Pilate simply didn't like the Jews and that he believed they were a stubborn and rebellious people. Well, we know that from the accounts of the country of Israel as recorded in the Old Testament as God has to work with this stubborn and rebellious people. Since uh, he was constantly suspicious of the Jews, when they brought him a prisoner for execution, he immediately uh, suspected that there was a hidden agenda at work. He didn't trust the Jews. So verse 12, Pilate asked them, then what should I do with the man that you called the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, crucify him. So we see that here's Barabbas, a real political enemy of Rome, one not falsely accused, but a political enemy that committed murder. And then we have Jesus, and Jesus has done nothing wrong. And he is accused, and, and they call, the Jewish people call for his crucifixion. Verse 14, why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? Well, it's a strange scene, a cruel, ruthless Roman governor trying to win the life of a miracle-working Jew against the strenuous efforts of both the Jewish leaders and this crowd that was stirred up by them. So Pilate says in 14, why? Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. So in the midst of this, Pilate believed he found a way to do what was right, yet not pay a price for it. He's cunning. Pilate thought Jesus could escape death if he were released according to the custom of releasing a prisoner every Passover season. But this didn't pacify the crowd. But consider this, if anyone was able to say, Jesus died for me, it would have been Barabbas. Barabbas knew he was to die. Barabbas knew of his own crimes. Barabbas knew what he had done. And here is somebody in his stead uh, taking his place. Jesus is going to die on behalf of the innocent in place of the guilty. And this was what Barabbas experienced, and this is what all of us who have believed in Jesus Christ have experienced over the centuries. The innocent dies for the guilty. Well, that then gets us to the point in our story where the soldiers are mocking Jesus. Verse 16, the soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters called the Praetorium and called out the entire regiment. They dressed Jesus in a purple robe. Now this was probably just a scarlet military cloak, cast off, faded rag, dirty, probably in a pile of, of other rags someplace but it had enough color to suggest the royal color of purple. So of course they're using that to really mock Jesus. And then they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the head with the reed stick, spat on him, and dropped to their knees in mock worship. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they then uh, took off the purple robe and put his clothes on him again, and then they led him away to be crucified. But think about this scene. What cruel people, what kind of person for anyone would do this kind of mocking, this kind of behavior? Who gets fun out of beating and torturing people? What kind of people treat another human being this way? But since it was part of God's plan, God permitted Satan to have his way with the soldiers as they carried out this mistreatment of Jesus. Now we come to the crucifixion. I don't know about you, but as a child, every year when we would come to Good Friday and we would come to Easter, that whole season, I loved the story of Jesus, but as we march closer to the crucifixion, it just made me more sad and more sad and until Easter came. So here we are at the crucifixion. After a scourging, a man to be crucified was forced to march in parade, led by a centurion on horseback. 
and a herald who shouted the crime of the condemned. And this was Rome's way of advertising a crucifixion and with ensuing horrific display of cruelty, make the people afraid of offending Rome. And this procession is the very thing that Jesus was referring to when he asked people, take up your cross and follow me. Verse 21, a passerby named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then. And the soldiers grabbed him and forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And then our scripture tells us Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, stop for a minute here and think about this. We are often blessed by the things that we are compelled to do. Simon did not want to carry the cross and probably resented it terribly when he was asked. Nevertheless, it probably became the most special and memorable moment of his life. And then there's that odd little statement identifying um, Simon, and it said his father Rufus. Well, just as a side note, apparently Rufus was known in the early church and was himself a Christian. Verse 22, and they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, and they offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. So when Jesus left the praetorium, with the guard, um, they were leading him. Uh, when he came to Golgotha, they had to carry him. They were burying him, the scripture tells us. And this was due to extreme weakness uh, from all that he had endured. Remember, he had no sleep. He probably had no food. He had gone through the emotional ordeal of, of Gethsemane, praying that he could avoid just what he was now facing. And so he was drained of every bit of human energy. Then on top of that, the beating that he took, the constant beating, the scourge, the whipping, uh, now carrying this heavy uh, cross beam of the cross and having his wounds open up again, uh, it's no wonder that they had to carry him or bear, bear him, as the scripture tells us. And then we see uh, Jesus is uh, taken to Golgotha, which is the place of the skull. And it's interesting here because there are two different places where it is thought that Jesus was crucified, and one of them is called Gordon's uh, Calvary, and it is a place that really resembles, when you stand back and look, as, um, as a skull. But nonetheless, uh, Golgotha, which means place of the skull, is where he was crucified. Verse 24, Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes, and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. Now yet again, every detail of Old Testament prophecy is fulfilled. This was in fulfillment of the prophecy that we read in Psalm 22, which says, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Well, verse 25, it was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. A sign announced the charge against him, and it read, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were also crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Now, how bad was crucifixion? Take note, we get our English word excruciating from the Roman word out of the cross or crucifixion. Consider how heinous sin must be in the sight of God when he subjects Jesus, requires Jesus to go through crucifixion, such a sacrifice. Verse 29, the people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. What kind of a scene is this? Here is a person on the cross being crucified, heinous, and he must have looked terrible after all the beatings, and still hatred and misunderstanding bubbling up in the hearts of the people were such that they could walk by this terrible scene and they could mock Jesus. Ha! Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and teachers of religious law also mocked Jesus. You know, again, the lessons that we can learn is this hideous darkness is within us because sin came into the world. 
And we are not above mocking those that we disagree with. We are not above mocking those that have a different point of view than us. We are just as guilty as the religious leaders of that day. Verse 31, again, the leading priests and teachers of religious law also mocked Jesus. And these leaders showed who they really were. They lowered themselves to this kind of behavior. They were supposed to lead the people, to follow the laws of God. And yet what were they doing? They were leading people into sin. It goes on, this, the passage tells us, as they mock him. He saved others, they scoffed but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross. Well, it is precisely because Jesus would not come down. I mean, consider it, he was God. He had all the attributes of God. He, in a flash of his eyes, could have wiped out those that were mocking him and come off of that cross. But he didn't, he suffered, he continued to suffer. He would not come down and he did that so that we would believe in him. He had to accomplish what the Father set before him. Jesus did something greater than coming down from that cross. That would have been an amazing miracle. But he does something different. He rises from the dead. They did not know or believe then that this was to occur. But many of the priests did eventually believe. Acts 6, 7 tells us a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So our scene eventually changes from this mockery, this sin, this darkness, this evil, to the bright light of resurrection and the joy of resurrection. And we see that even many of these priests came to an obedient faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Um, so uh, they say, let this Messiah, King of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see and believe him. Even the men who crucified Jesus, uh, with Jesus, ridiculed him. The man on either side of him, Mark tells us. All who were present, all who were present, joined in with the mocking. It was a runaway crowd mentality, and Satan was turned loose at this dark moment. Well, then we read the death of Jesus, verse 33. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until about three o'clock. Now this is especially remarkable because during a full moon, and the Passover was always held at a full moon. We know that from history and scripture. So uh, it's remarkable because during a full moon, a natural eclipse of the sun is impossible. So this was an extraordinary miracle that occurred in the heavens. Verse 34, then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Jesus not only endured the withdrawal of the Father's fellowship, but also the actual outpouring of the Father's wrath upon him as a substitute for sinful humanity. The weight of that crushing him, horrible as this was, it was to fulfill God's good and loving plan of redemption. Therefore, uh, in Isaiah, we could see this prophecy, and it said, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's Isaiah 53.10. And at the same time, we cannot say that the separation between the Father and the Son at the cross was complete, because as 2 Corinthians 5.19 tells us, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself at the cross. So Jesus felt the total abandonment of God, and yet it wasn't complete, as Corinthians tells us, because Christ himself uh, had God within him, reconciling the world. Verse 35, some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink it. Wait, he said, this person offering the drink to Jesus. Let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. Then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. Now we do know from the Gospel of Luke that Jesus said, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. So then Mark tells us, Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. 
and the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple at that moment was torn in two from top to bottom. The tearing of the temple veil signified that now man had free access to the throne of grace by the cross and that no one should ever think again that God dwells in temples made with human hands. Significantly, as the wall of separation between God and man was removed by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the veil was torn from top to bottom. God tore it from heaven instead of man tearing it from earth. So top to bottom indicates no human could have performed this desecration of the temple veil. It had to have been accomplished not as a desecration, but an action by God to demonstrate and to show that humankind, there was no barrier between us and God because of the work of Jesus Christ, his son. Verse 39, when the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, this man truly was the son of God. Now this is an interesting um, note that's put in there by Mark. The force of these events deeply impacted the soldier. History and the centurion's position tells us that the centurion had seen many people crucified before. Yet there was something so remarkable about Jesus that he said something that he could not say about anyone else. Truly, this man is the Son of God. So there's so many ways that Jesus testifies to the truth of him being God himself. His words, the scripture, his Holy Spirit, and obviously here in this act at the cross, another testimony to who God really was. Verse 40, some women were there watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph, and Salome. They had been followers of Jesus and had cared for him while he was in Galilee. Many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem were also there. Now this is interesting here. In God's kingdom, women were welcomed, were believers, and uh, were influencers. Here Mark reveals who some of the most brave and faithful disciples of Jesus were, and they were the women who followed Jesus. So we come in our chapter 15 to the burial of Jesus. Verse 42. So this all happened on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk. So let's stop here. What is Joseph risking? Well, he risked Pilate's animosity of scorn or scorn. So Jer Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' Jesus's body. Joseph, the scripture tells us, Mark tells us, was an honored member of the high council, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. So this Joseph was apparently silent when the council sentenced Jesus to death in Mark uh, 15.1. He must have shrunk back then, but now here he has a change of heart after the crucifixion, and he's not ashamed to identify with Jesus in his death. Verse 44. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead. So he called for the Roman officer and asked if Jesus had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead. How do we understand this? Well, typically crucifixion was a long, agonizing death. If it wasn't suffocation, it was just the, the splitting of the human organs from the uh, the trauma that uh, crucifixion caused. It was an agonizing death, yet Jesus died in a matter of hours, not days. Pilate personally investigated the matter of Jesus' death and received reliable eyewitness testimony from the centurion who had witnessed perhaps hundreds of crucifixion and was an expert in knowing if a man was dead or not. So a Roman sergeant would have seen many deaths and to be uncertain and, and would, would have no, no uncertainty about such effect of his death. So back to our scripture. So Pilate told Joseph he could have the body and Joseph brought a long sheet of linen cloth and then he took Jesus' body down from the cloth, cross, wrapped it in the cloth and laid it in a tomb. 
uh, that had been carved out of the rock. This would not be a pleasant task. Can you imagine the beating that Jesus took? What occurred uh, with the piercing his side with a spear, uh, his broken legs, the nails through his hands? And uh, Joseph lovingly takes this task. And he had to do it in a hurry. He, could, he just brought a sheet of linen cloth, and he must hurry because he had to achieve this before uh, the Sabbath day came. Now, tombs such as this that Joseph offered for Jesus was very expensive. So it was really a sacrifice for Joseph of Arimathea to give up this tomb that he had probably planned to be buried in himself. But here we see again that Jesus needed the tomb only for a few days. It was only temporary. Joseph didn't know that, but we have the benefit of Scripture telling us that. Then Joseph rolled a stone in front of the entrance. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus laid the body, or excuse me, where Joseph laid the body of Jesus. So as we end chapter 15 here, it's an important note. With eyewitnesses to the death and burial, there could be no conspiracy theories regarding the death and location of the body of Jesus. Well, something further to consider here. Read the passages below from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Look at how accurately these words of Isaiah written over 650 years before Jesus walked our earth mirror the actual occurrences Mark records regarding the suffering and the death of Jesus as well as the purpose for all that Christ went through. It's amazing. Notice in Mark how Jesus takes it all on, remains silent and fulfills the will of his Father just as Isaiah prophesied. Let me read it and consider what we've just read in Mark as I do. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. That's Isaiah 50. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb in the slaughter, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. The Lord makes his life an offering for sin. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life, resurrection, and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, that salvation and he will bear their iniquities. That's Isaiah 53. The continuity of the Bible, the truth of the Bible is borne out when we see these scriptures and these prophecies coming through from the Old Testament to the New. Now, tongue in cheek here, extra credit for those thusly modified, mo <laughs> motivated. Read the account of the crucifixion in each of the gospels and take note of the differing emphasis or additional detail each gospel writer brings to the account. Each one uh, is inspired by the Holy Spirit, almost dictated by the Holy Spirit, but each one has a perspective. We've said before Luke the physician would have great interest in, in all those things of, of a medical nature. Finally then, pray this week and pray these things, will you? Pray that the peoples of the world, not just the United States, but the world, will not grow worry, weary, complacent, but each individual will take the needed precautions to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Pray for God's comfort for those who have lost a loved one, either from the virus or from some other tragic event or from just aging process. And then finally, Pray for those who have lost a job or are worried about food, worried about housing. Ask God to meet their needs and to raise up individuals and organizations and governments to help these people that have had such a loss. Well, that is our passage in our study uh, for this week. Um, may God bless it to your hearts. In Jesus' name.